This lecture video is, <clears throat> excuse me, on um, activity 3.6 in your textbook, and it's going to be about linear functions and then um, more specifically about profit and revenue functions. So um, the example that we're going to use to talk about this today um, is is here. So Professor. Abrahamson um, Social Psychology's class is organizing a campus entertainment night to benefit charities in the community. You are a member of the budget committee for this class project. The committee suggests an admission donation of $10 per person. And so each person is going to pay $10 um, to get in. And that's going to be, be for food, the non-alcoholic beverages, and entertainment. The committee members expect that each student in attendance will purchase a raffle ticket for $1. Faculty members volunteer to MC the event and perform comedy sketches. Two student bands are hired at a cost of $200 each. So there's two of them. And I think that um, I will go with some different colors here so things pop out better. So the admission donation is $10 a person and they expect each person to buy a raffle ticket for a dollar and then um, our expenses will have two hundred dollars for two bands and then um, one thousand dollars for food and drinks two hundred dollars for paper products and a hundred dollars for posters and tickets and five hundred dollars for raffle prizes the college is donating the use of the gymnasium for the event and in this first question, we want to determine the total fixed costs for the entertainment night. So no matter how many students show up for this thing, um, we need to figure out how much putting on this event is going to cost. So no matter what, we're going to have to pay for both bands. And so each of them were $200. And because there were two of them, that's going to be $400. And then $1,000 for food and drinks. So we'll just list that as food. Um, so we got the band money, we got the $100 for food, and then $200 for paper products. And $100 for posters. And $500 for prizes. So all of this stuff we're going to have to um, pay for no matter how many people attend our event. So we have 0, 0, and then we have 4, 6, 7, 12, and then 1 and 1 is 2. So total fixed costs. are $2,200. So no matter how many students come, we're going to have to pay out that much. Next, we want to determine the total revenue. That's our gross income before expenses are deducted if 400 students attend and each buys a raffle ticket. So the raffle tickets were $1, and they have to pay that $10 donation to get in. So each student is going to pay $1 for their raffle ticket. and $10 for admissions. OK, so, um, so that's a total of $11 for each student. And if 400 of them attend, then that would be 11 times 400. So that would be $4,400. <coughs> And so this is revenue. So this is money that you'll take in, but it does not take into account any of the money that we spent to put on the event. Now we want to determine the profit, which is the net income after expenses are deducted. And that's, again, if 400 students attend and each buys a single raffle ticket. So the amount of money that we'll take in from them um, coming in the door is the $4,400. And then we have to subtract off our costs for putting on the event. And that was $2,200. OK, 
Okay, so revenue minus cost will give you profit. The total revenue or gross income for the event depends on the number of students n who attend. Write an expression in terms of n that represents the total revenue if n students attend and each buys a raffle ticket. So revenue, uh, well, um, they just want an expression, so we won't give it a name. We won't write it as a function just yet. So we want revenue if n students attend, and we're assuming that they each buy a raffle ticket, so that would be $10 for their admissions, and then the $1 for their raffle ticket, and so the expression for revenue would be 11n. Write a symbolic function rule defining profit, P of n, in terms of the number of students n. Um, in attendance, remember that the total fixed cost for the entertainment night is um, $2,200. So our revenue is going to be 11n, and our costs are the $2,200. So we have to subtract off our costs. And um, they did want this written as a function. So P of n profit will be equal to the revenue, 11n, minus the fixed cost of $2,200. Now we want to list some replacement values for the practical domain. Um, this is for the input val variable n, and it's meaningful. Is it meaningful to have a value of one half or negative three? So one half is not reasonable. Or we'll say not practical. And the reason that this is not practical is because half a person can't attend. You can't have half a person attend. Is negative 3 practical? This is not practical. Um, because you'll never have a negative number of people attend. So worst case scenario is that nobody attends. Okay, so now we want to list the practical domain. So we could possibly have zero people attend. We might have one, we might have two, we might have three, and this keeps on going up. And um, so far we don't know um, what the biggest possible number of um, students could attend, so that would depend on how many students there were. Now we want to use a symbolic rule that we um, created in 3b to determine the profit if 100 students attend. So we want to find p of 100. So this notation means I want to figure out what the profit is if the number n of students that attend is 100. So again, remember that this is not multiplication. And so our function p of n, I'll just write that down, was 11n minus 2200. So we want to know what would this value be if n is 100. That's what this notation means. So we're going to replace this n with 100. Oops, I'm doing it in blue right now. So I'll switch back to my blue pen. So 11 times 100 is 1100. And then minus, whoops, one too many zeros, minus 2200 gives me a negative um, 1100. What is the practical meaning of the negative value for the profit in part A? So what this means is, so this is our revenue, this $1100, that's what we take in from the 100 um, people that attend, this is our cost. So this negative value means that we will be losing money. and we're actually going to be losing $1,100.
the gymnasium holds a maximum of 650 people. What's the maximum amount of money that can be donated to charity? So here's the maximum number of people we can allow in because it's the maximum number of people that can be in the gym. And so this would be that upper bound in our practical domain up above. So again, we want to figure out um, what's our maximum profit if we fill the whole gym up. So we want to know what is P of um, 650, and I just wrote that um, profit function down. Again, it's P of N equals 11N minus 2200. So we want to replace that N with 650. That's what this notation means. So we'll have 11 times 650 minus the 2200. And I need to break out my calculator for that one. So we want to do 650 times 11, and that gives me $7,150. And so subtract from that 2200. And so that's $4,950. So that's going to be our maximum profit. And I'm just going to double check my calculation here. I don't trust myself. So yes, I was correct on that. OK, in our next problem, suppose that the members of the class want to be able, um, OK, so we got a typo here. repeated myself. So um, they want to be able to donate $1,000 to community charities, write an equation to determine how many students must attend the entertainment night for there to be a profit of $1,000, and then solve the equation. So we want our profit to be $1,000. So our profit equation, so P of N is the notation we're using for profit and that was equal to 11n minus 2200. And so this, again, p of n is your profit, n is the number of students. We want to know how many students do I need to have for there to be $1,000 in profit. And so we're going to replace the p of n with 1,000. So our equation would become 1,000 equals 11n minus 2200. And we want to solve this equation and figure out how many students that would be. So to solve this, we're going to add the 2200 to both sides, because we want to get this n alone. So that will give us 3200 equals 11n. And then the last thing to do to get n by itself is divide by 11. And so we'll do that on our calculators again. So 3200. Um, divided by 11 gives us 290.90 repeating. Okay, so we want the number of students that we would need in order for there to be a thousand dollars. If you do less than this number, then you're going to have less than $1,000. So you would need to round this up to the nearest whole student. So that would be 291. So normally we would round this up. But even if this were 0 0.01, you would still need to round this up to the nearest whole student um, in order to achieve an actual $1,000 in profit. How many students must attend for there to be $2,000 to donate to local charities? So basically, $2,000 is our profit. So replace the P of N with 2,000. So 2,000 equals 11N minus 2,200. And so now we're going to do the same thing, solve this for N. So add 2,200 to both sides. And this time we get 4,200 equals 11n. And now divide both sides by 11.
and we get 381 with an 81 repeating. And so again, if we want to make sure that we have at least $2,000, if not a little bit more, we would round this up to 382 students. And I should label this one with students as well. Now we want to complete this table of values for the charity event. So first we want to um, calculate what our profit would be if no students attend. So that's P of 0. So that would be 11 times 0 minus 2200, which would give us a negative 2200. And then we want to calculate the profit for 50 students. So that would be P of 50. That's going to be 11 times 50 minus 2200. Oh, so 11 times 50, that's going to be um, 550 minus the 2200. Subtracting off that um, 2200 gives us negative 1650. Now we want to um, calculate for 200 or 100 students, which we did up above. Um, that calculation is right here, and it gave us negative 1100. And if 200 students come, so that's going to be P of 200, and that's 11 times 200 minus 2200. And 11 times 200 is 2200 minus 2200 gives us 0. And then we want the profit for 300 students, so 11 times 300 minus 2200. That's going to be 3,300 minus 2,200, which is 1,100. And then for 400 students, so P of 400. And I thought we did that one already as well. Maybe not. All right, so replace um, N with 400 gives us 11 times 400 minus 2200, and that'll be 4400 minus 2200, and so that gives us 2200. Determine the average rate of change in profit as the number of students in attendance increases from 300 to 400. So remember, average rate of change is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1, or change in y divided by change in x. And we want to do it for 300 to 400, so here are the numbers that we need. And on the top, we do the difference of the y's. Um, so we're going to do 2200 minus 1100. divided by 400 minus 300. So again, I started with this number for the difference of the y, so we have to start with this number for the difference of the x's. So 400 minus 300. And I'll finish this calculation over here. So 2200 minus 1100 is 1100. And 400 minus 300 is 100. And so we can cancel off two zeros and we get 11. And the units on this is dollars per. So the numerator is dollars. Division means the word per. And then underneath we have students. And this is for an individual student.
determine the average rate of change between consecutive data pairs in the table. So basically they want us to do this for every single um, point in the table, but we'll just do it for a couple more. Um, and then once we do it for a couple, you know, you'll start to see the pattern. So um, we'll do it for the first two points. So again, average rate of change is, oops, let me write that more clearly for you. Average rate of change is equal to y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And so we're going to do negative 1650 minus negative 2200. So negative 1650. And we're subtracting. And from that, we're subtracting a negative 2200. And then divided by 50 minus 0. OK, so I already have the negative 1650 in my calculator. So then minus 2200, and I need it to be negative 2200. And so that gives me 550. And 50 divided by 0 is 50. And 55, 550 divided by 50 is 11. And again, this is dollars per student. And so we got the same thing as we got the last time. We'll do one more with two different data points and um, so that you can see what happens there. So I'll change my pen color and I'll select two new data points. Um, let's see. We'll use this data point and um, this data point. OK, so our average rate of change formula we already have written down. And so I'm going to do this y2 minus y1. So on the top, that's going to be 0 minus a negative 1650 divided by x2 minus x1. And so that will be 200 minus 50. So on the top, this is 0 plus 1650. So we get 1650 on the top. And 200 minus 50 is 150. And when we do this, um, you might have guessed already that we should get 11. So 1650 divided by 150 doesn't, whoops, I must have not typed in one of my zeros. 1650 divided by 150. And we do, in fact, get 11. And again, this is dollars per student. And it won't matter what two points you pick. You can check this out. Pick any two data points, calculate the average rate of change, and you should always um, come up with 11. Is profit a linear function of the number of students attending? And the answer to that is yes. And it's true because the average rate of change is always the same. And in fact, it's $11 per student. Now we want to sketch a graph of the profit function. So first, we need to label our tick marks. We know one point, of course, that's going to be the point zero, 00. I have. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. 21 tick marks. And that's along the x-axis. And we can go from 0 to 650. And so we want to take, um, so our range here is from 0 to 650, so it has a length of 650. And I want to divide that by the number of tick marks I have. And I'm just going to go by 20 because I know that 21 isn't going to go in there evenly. So neither does um, 20. We get 32.5. Um, and let's go check what. So we go up by either 50 or by um, 100. So um, 
I'm just going to go up to 50 on this. So each of my tick marks is going to be worth 50. I'm going to label every other. So that's 100, 200, 300, 400, 500, 600, and we can stop at 700 because we won't have anything beyond that. Okay. And in the positive direction, I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tick marks. And we go from zero on up to $2,200 for our profit. And actually, our max profit, where is that? Right here. So 5,000. So I want to go from zero to 5,000. And so um, I get 555. Um, so anything bigger than that, we'll make sure that we cover everything. And um, it's always nice to pick numbers that are going to work well with the numbers that you're getting. And so I'm going to go back up and look at our table here quickly. So our profits are 2200 and then we have this weird one of 1650 and then we have 1100 and 1100 and 2200 um, our max profit was also kind of a weird one but because it looks like there's this nice $1,100 thing going on, I would do $550, which is half of $1,100, but um, that's not going to quite give me enough spaces on my graph. So, um, so I'm going to go ahead and let each of my tick marks be $1,100. And then also label in the negative direction as well. And negative 2200 was our first point, so we can just stop there. So 0, negative 2200 was our first data point. Our next one is 50, negative 1650. Um, and um, so this is negative 1100. And I'm guessing that that 1650 might be directly in between these two. So um, half of 1100 is 550. And if we take 1100 and add on to that 550, we do in fact get 1650. So the 1650 is directly in between um, the 1100 and the 2200. So. There's our next data point, and that's 50, negative 1650. And then our next one is 0, negative 1100, or sorry, 100, negative 1100. So that's right there, and my labeling is getting kind of messy. And then our next data point is um, 200, 0. And then 300 um, is 1100. And then 400 was 2200. And then um, our maximum profit, let's go back up and check that point. And so it was 650, 4950. So 650 is right here. And we want to go to 4950. And my guess is, is that in fact it is. If you add 550 onto this, you'll get 4950. So it's um, halfway up there. So remember, a, a full tick mark is 1100. So half a tick mark is 550. So, so right there is our. Um, data point, and that was 650 
and 4950. And so there are all of our data points plotted. And notice all of these points lie directly on a line. And that's because it's a linear function. So that answers this next question. Why should you expect all the plotted points to be on the same line? And it's because our profit function is linear. Determine the slope of the line representing the profit function in problem 8a, where um, what are the units of measure of the slope and what is the practical meaning of the slope in this situation. So the slope m is y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. And notice this is exactly the same as our average rate of change formula. And so no matter what two points we pick, remember, we're going to end up getting 11. And the units on this is dollars per student. And so what this means is that for each student, that attends the event, the profit will, and because this is a positive slope, our profit will increase by our slope, $11. What is the vertical intercept of the lines? So remember, the vertical intercept is our y-axis. That's our vertical line. And that intercept, so where is it crossing the y-axis? It's crossing it right here at negative 2,200. And I'm just going to go back up here. I didn't label my x-axis. Um, X axis is N, and that's number of students. And our Y axis is P of N, and that's profit in dollars. So um, you should make sure that you label those, and I forgot to. Um, what is the practical meaning of the vertical intercept in this situation? So the practical meaning of this is that um, if no students attend, um, we'll lose $2,200. Well, I'll say if no students attend. Oops, wrong number. So if no, none of the students attend the event, we're going to lose um, $2,200. What is the horizontal intercept? So again, I wrote that because that's our horizontal axes. And so that's the x-axis. And that's happening right here um, at 200 students. And I'm just going to put a dollar sign there for that, because that's money. And what's the practical meaning of the horizontal intercept of this situation? So um, if 200 students attend, the profit will be $0. Okay, so we won't be making any money, we won't be losing any money. This actually has a special name. When profit is zero or you're not making or losing any money, it's called the break-even point. Okay, so the break-even point is when profit is zero dollars. It means that what it costs you to do something is equal to the revenue that you're taking in for that thing, whatever it happens to be. 
Next we're going to talk about slope intercept form of the equation of a line. And um, slope intercept form is y equals mx plus b. m is our slope. And b is our y intercept. Hence the name slope intercept form. So our profit function, p of n equals 11n minus 2200, um, has this symbolic form that, rep that is representative of all linear functions. That is, the symbolic form of a linear function consists of the sum of two terms, um, a variable term, the input variable multiplied by its coefficient, and a constant term, a fixed number. Identify the variable term in the symbolic rule p of n equals 11n minus 2200, and what is its coefficient? 11n is the variable term. And the coefficient is the number in front of the variable, and so that's 11. Identify the constant term. The constant term is the plain old number, so that's negative 2200. And you always take the sign in front of it with it. What characteristics of the linear function graph does the coefficient of the input variable n represent? And so that's the 11 here, and it represents the slope. What characteristic of a linear function graph does the constant term represent? Um, and that's the negative 2200, and that's the y-intercept, or here the p of n intercept. Consider a line defined by the equation y equals 2x plus 7. Use the equation to complete the following table. So if x is negative 2, then we would get 2 times negative 2 plus 7, which is negative 4 plus 7, and that's 3. If x is negative 1, we get 2 times negative 1 plus 7, so that's negative 2 plus 7, or 5. And if we plug 0 in there, we get 2 times 0 plus 7, which is 0 plus 7, or 7. And if we plug 1 in, we get 2 times 1 plus 7, which is 2 plus 7, or 9. And when we plug 2 in, we get 2 times 2 plus 7, which is 4 plus 7, or 11. And so notice, each time that I moved my x value, each time my x value increased by 1, my y value increased by 2, which is our slope. Use the slope formula to determine the slope of the line. How does the slope compare to the coefficient of x in the equation? So our slope formula is m equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So I'm just going to pick two of these points. And so we'll just pick these two right here, kind of in the middle. Doesn't matter, you can pick any two points you want. And so we're going to do the difference of the y's on the top, so 7 minus 5 on the top, and then 0 minus a negative 1 on the bottom. 7 minus 5 is 2, and 0 minus a negative 1 is 0 plus 1 or 1, and so we get 2. And so our slope 2 is the same as the coefficient of our variable term. Determine the vertical or the y-intercept, and how does it compare to the constant term in the equation of the line? So we want the vertical intercept, so that's where is this thing crossing the y-axis, and remember anything that's on the x-axis has an x-coordinate of 0. So we want 0, and we want to figure out what would be in this position. So we got that in our table. So here is the place where x is 0, so our y-intercept is 7.
And how does that compare to the constant term in our equation? It's the same. So here's the equation for our slope-intercept form, y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope of the line, and this point 0b is the y-intercept. So in the last group of problems, we're going to indicate the slope and the vertical intercept of each of the following linear functions. So again, um, we're looking at y equals mx plus b. This number is our slope. It's always the number in front of x, and this number is our um, y-intercept. And it's a point 0b. So our first one, um, y equals negative 3x plus 8, so our slope is negative 3. And our y-intercept is positive 8, so that gives us the point 0, 8. Our next one, y equals 3 fourths x minus 1 half. So our slope m is 3 fourths, the number right in front of the variable. And then our intercept is negative 1 half, so that's a point 0, negative 1 half. In this next one, y equals negative 5x. So negative 5, the number in front of x, is our um, slope. So our m equals negative 5. And then there is nothing added over here, so that's 0. So our y-intercept is 0, 0. The next one, y equals negative 3x. So there is no number in front of the variable term. And so that tells me that I have a slope of 0. And I'm going to change this to red just because that's what I was doing my slope stuff in. And then the plain old number is negative 3, so that gives me an intercept of 0, negative 3. In our next one, y equals 16 plus 4x, so again, the slope is always the number that's directly in front of our variable, and so this time my slope is 4. And the plain old number here is 16, so that gives me a y-intercept of 0, 16. And in the next one here, the number in front of our variable term is negative 3, so my slope is negative 3. And the number that doesn't have any variable with it is 110. So my y-intercept is 0, 110. In our next one, we have p equals negative 12 plus 2.5n. Again, the number in front of the variable term is our slope, so my slope is 2.5. And the number in front of, or the plain old number, sorry, is negative 12. And so that gives me um, a y-intercept of 0, negative 12. And in the last one in this group, we have q equals negative 45 minus 9r. So the number in front of the variable is negative 9, so my slope is negative 9. And the plain old number is negative 45, so that gives me a y-intercept of 0, negative 45. All right, so this is the final grouping of problems. And for each of these, we've been given the slope and the y-intercept. And we want to write out the equation y equals mx plus b. So in our first one, they tell us that the slope is 3 and the y-intercept is 0, 4. So it's y equals the slope, which is 3. And then that's the one that get mul gets multiplied to our variable term. And then our intercept is 4, and so that's going to be plus 4. The next one, the slope is negative 1, and the y-intercept is 0, 0. So it's going to be y equals negative 1 is our slope, so that's going to be negative 1. 
and then that gets multiplied to our variable term x. And then you can either add the plus 0 or you can just leave it, right? Because plus 0 would just be negative 1x. And um, you really don't need to have the 1 in front of the x either. You could just write negative x. So there are a couple of different ways we could write this. I'll put the plus 0 here. Some other modified forms of this would just be to have y equals negative 1x, or you could just have y equals negative x. So all three of these mean exactly the same thing. The next one here, we have a slope of 2 thirds. And so our equation is going to be y is equal to our slope 2 thirds times x. And our intercept is 6, so that's going to be plus 6. And then we're done. In the last one here, we have a slope that's 0. And we have a y-intercept that's negative 5. So we'll have y is equal to, and we'll just write all of this out. It would be 0 times our variable x. And then our slope is negative 5, so that's going to be minus 5. And just like um, in this example B, we had this 0 on here. Now we have 0 here. 0 times anything is 0. So this is also exactly the same as y equals negative 5. So this is typically how you would write this one, and this is the more typical way to write um, example B. Okay, that's it for this lecture. Let me know if you have any questions. Thanks.